Well, the remarks that I will present today belong to an archaeological project, or rather, to the dream of an archaeological project. We are examining the models of temporality through which we have been accustomed to conceive the construction of a common world in art and in politics. I will examine more precisely today the concepts that have been used for more than one century to historicize the transformations of artistic practices and to connect them with social and political transformations, notably the concepts of modernity and avant-garde. Briefly speaking, we have two conflicting models to think of modernism and avant-garde. The first one has often been assimilated to a naive will to dissolve the, practi the practice of art in order to make them feed the spilling off of modern life. The enchantment of electricity, the rhythms of the machines, the speed of the cars, the sharpness of steel and cement, and all of those idols of the modern celebrated is the famous Futurist Manifesto written by Marinetti. On the other hand, artistic modernism since the time of Clement Greenberg has been described as the conquest of the autonomy of art, its separation from the forms of commodity culture, and the commitment of each art to its own medium. Instead, I would like to show that the notions of modernity, modernism, and avant-garde entail a complex and paradoxical intertwinement of temporalities, a complex set of relations between the present, the past, and the future, between anticipation and lateness, fragmentation and continuity, movement and immobility. This paradoxical intertwinement of temporality has been first set up in Hegel's aesthetics, and in a way, the whole history of what is called artistic modernism is made of the attempts to solve the Hegelian formulation of the paradox. Hegel, as you know, made of the very concept of art the concept of a distance. What we see as art in museums was not his search because it was not art for those who produced it. It was the form under which they tried to express the spirit of their collective form of life. That spirit, however, had not yet reached its self-consciousness and was still unable to give an objective form to its own content. Our verse, according to Hegel, was the expression of that spirit outside of itself, in the external materiality of the sculpted stone, the painted surface, or the poetic meter. But in modern times, the spirit that animated the progress of history had became, become conscious of itself in science, and the collective life of the people was now embodied, adequately embodied in the institutional forms of economy, constitutional government, and administration. This is what modernity meant. And that's why art had lost its substantial content. It could, be, it could no more be the flowering of a form of life. It, beca it became thus a pure manifestation of technical virtuosity, a mere self-demonstration. It became the imitation of art, which meant the end of art. So either art or modernity, such is the original Hegelian dilemma, with which all attempts at defining or practicing art and art of modernity had to cope since almost two centuries. This paradox is at the core of the main modernist narrative, the one that made modernism the conquest of the autonomy of art and medium specificity. I, I, I would like to show it out of the text which formulated the credo of the so-called modernist view of art. I mean Clement Greenberg's text, Avant-Garde and Kitsch, published in 1939. While agreeing with this argument or rejecting it, the commentators, I think, have not paid enough attention to its paradoxical aspect. Greenberg's analysis predicates the task of the artistic avant-garde on the impossibility of escaping the historical necessity that he describes in terms of decline. He said that the development of capitalist society had broken, I quote him, the accepted notions upon which artists and writers must depend in large part for communication with their audiences. The verities involved by religion, authority, tradition, style are thrown into question so that the artists are no longer able to estimate the response of their audience to the symbols and references with which they work." End of quote. In such a way, he said, the modern artists found themselves back in the same situation as the artists of late antiquity who had fallen into the subtleties of Alexandrianism when their art was no more rooted in the collective life of the democratic cities. In the same way, he says, the avant-garde is now more and more detached from the life of the people. Hence, it is more and more strictly devoted to imitating the fact of imitating. 
This was exactly like the Hegelian end of art. But Greenberg's operation precisely consists in turning the Hegelian fatal destiny of the end of art into the future of art, the historical task of avant-garde artists. The avant-garde, he says, is not like those antique Alexandrian artists. They were immobile. Instead, the avant-garde must ceaselessly move forward. Now, moving forward, this means becoming more and more detached from the life of the people. In the Hegelian logic, this means that the avant-garde must become more and more decadent. But if it must be so, Greenberg says, it is because there is another form of art that he calls rearguard, though the so-called rearguard is perfectly attuned to the development of capitalist society, namely what he names kitsch culture, that offers industrially made products to the consumption of the sons and daughters of peasants, who now enjoy in the industrial towns a time of leisure for which no cultural tradition had prepared them. Avant-gardeism, in short, is the acceleration of capitalist decadence that must win the race over the living expression of capitalist development embodied for him in Kitsch culture. I think that this narrative that has become dominant in the interpretation of artistic modernity provides us with both the poorest and the most absurd version of the modernist paradox. If it is so, I think, it is so, I think, because this paradigm of modernity was invented on purpose to erase the much more complex version of the paradox, which was the basis of true historical modernism. It is this complex employment of times that I would like to spell out in two times. First, by looking at a text, a 19th century text, which proposes a quite different understanding of the temporality of modernity and modern art. Second, by looking at a work of art which epitomizes the paradox of the modernist project and of its politics. I start from the text. In, 19, in 1941, in Boston, Ralph Waldo Eberson wrote an essay simply called The Poet, in which he overturns in a very different way the Hegelian view of modernity. Hegel had defined modernity as a time of concordance. Instead, Emerson defines modernity as a time of non-concordance, of non-contemporaneity, and locates both the necessity and the possibility of a new art of poetry in this lack of contemporaneity. The material elements of the modern world are there, he said, but there is no thread uniting them in a common world. It's not the case that we live in a time after, when modernity has achieved its process and leaves no place for art. On the contrary, we live in a time before, a time of the not yet. We have yet, and I quote him, we have yet had no genius in America with tyrannous eye, which knew the value of our incomparable materials, and so, in the barbarism and materialism of the time, another carnival of the same gods whose picture is so much admired in Homer. Banks and tariffs, the newspaper and caucus, Metallism and Unitarianism are flat and dull to dull people, but rest on the same foundations of wonder as the town of Troy and the temple of Delphos. Our log rolling, our stumps and their politics, our fisheries, our negroes and Indians, our bows and our repudiations, the wrath of frogs and the pusillanimity of the honest men, etc., etc., are yet unsung. Yes, yet America is a poem in our eyes. It is its ample geography dazzles the imagination and it will not wait long for meters. So on the one hand, modernity is a chaos. The prose of the new continent has not yet found its expression. We are still in front of those new material phenomena as vulgar, prosaic things, situations, and characters, confined in the economical and egoistical relation between an immediate use value and an abstract exchange value. The same things, characters, and situations must be given another value as symbols as a of a collective form of life. The modern problem, then, consists in constructing a new sense of community, a new sensory fabric where the prosaic activities get the poetic dimension for which they compose a common world. However, it's not a question of waiting for time to produce the concordance between the prose of material interests and the spiritual sense of the new world. This concordance has to be produced through a specific mediation. It is this specific mediation that is implemented for him in, in the task of the new poet. 
His specific task is to weave this thread that turns the prose of modern economic life into a common sensible world. It is to anticipate a future that does not yet exist. <coughs> now, if a new poet can do so, it is because the time of the not yet is itself divided. The American people of the 1830s, 1840s live in a time when the rationality of political economy and administration has not yet disciplined the chaos of material interests and prosaic activities. It is in the very barbarism of that time, it is in the lateness of modernity, that what one must find the poetic thread with which it is possible to anticipate a new fabric of community. It is out of the noisy disharmony of the present that the new poet will find the harmony of the future, the wild pulse of the new life. Though the term did not exist at that moment, I think that the, that the Emersonian formulation of the task of the poet to come provides us with the best view of what an artistic avant-garde may mean. The avant-garde is not the detachment that goes ahead of the army. Let alone it is the last battalion resisting the triumphic army, triumphing army of commodity culture. The avant-garde is located in the difference of modern times with themselves. It is a force that finds in the lateness of the present the means of anticipating the future. What gives to this diagnosis its full relevance is that it runs parallels to another diagnosis made at the same moment by a thinker more, more readily associated with the idea of avant-garde than Emerson, namely Karl Marx. In his text of 1843, Marx dealt with the same issue of non-contemporaneity when he refuted the Hegelian thesis of a modernity defined by the concordance between thought and its world. On the, on the contrary, the present of Germany witnessed, he said, a perfect disharmony. German philosophy had elaborated a theory of human liberation that had no correlate in the feudal and bureaucratic misery of contemporary Germany. It was for this very reason that Germany could achieve a still unheard of revolution, a human revolution skipping over the merely political revolution. But it could do so on one condition, namely that it would appropriate the energy of the active transformation of the world that the French revolutionary fighters were able to deploy without being able to give it any theoretical formulation. Using the power of anticipation, extracted from the very lateness of the present, to construct a new future, such is, the, I think, the employment of times common to Marx and to Emerson at that moment. Art has no place in Marx's analysis. But it transpires as though Emerson's analysis anticipated the rule of anticipation that Marxist artists would assign to their practice in the times of the Soviet Revolution, a rule both required and rejected by the Marxist combination of French political action and German science. I wish to make this point about this conflict of modernity out of a short sequence of a film, namely Ziga Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera. A short sequence that we, that we saw you know, in, my, in, in my seminar, but that I, I, want to, uh, I want to look at here from a different angle, at the, the, the angle of this conflict of temporality. Well, this film, released in 1982, 80, 28, sorry, is part of a project that was widely shared at the time by Soviet avant-garde artists, in spite of their divergences. The project of breaking the separation between art and life, of using the means of art no more to produce artworks for the enjoyment of art connoisseurs or bourgeois estates, but to create new forms of life. <clears throat> so it is a revolutionary film, but a revolutionary film is not a film about revolution. It's not a work of art belonging to an art called cinema and dedicated to the representation of a social event called revolution. It's an activity which is part of all the activities that constitute communism, not as a political system, but as a new fabric of common sensible ex ex experience. At the same time, this activity, this act specific activity of, of the filmmaker has a specific goal, precisely that of connecting all those activities by giving them a common measure of time or a common time. This common time has three main characteristics. 
First, its matter is the everyday. It connects all of those activities that make the present of everyday in a modern city, from the awakening in the morning to the evening leisure, for the activities of working in factories, shops, public transportation, etc. Now, it's not a matter of describing the everyday life in a city. The everyday is at once a period of time and a pattern of temporality. In the ninth book of his poetics, Aristotle had opposed the poetic construction of the plot, which creates a lot by connecting actions according to necessity or verisimilitude to the chronicle, which merely tells the things as they happen, one after the other, in their empirical succession. In 1922, Virginia Woolf wrote an essay called Modern Fiction, which equates modernity in literature with the disruption of that hierarchy. The time of modern fiction is the time of all the events that fall on the minds at every moment coming from everywhere. And the task of the modern writer is to draw a thread that gives to that shower of atoms its time. So what is opposed to the causal logic of the plot is not so much succession as it is coexistence. The time of modern fiction is the modern time inside which all events penetrate and resonate into one another. The time of Joyce, the, the, the time of the day of Joyce Ulysses, or of the days of Wolf's Mrs. Dalloway, the times also of Zigavert of Man's with a movie camera. The chronicle of a day is in reality the construction of the time of coexistence, the time in which all the activities penetrate into one another to constitute a new fabric of common life. So, in the terms of Emerson, it's a question of weaving, weaving the spiritual thread between all the activities. In the times of cinema and communism, this spiritual task is called, more prosaically, montage. Werthoff's montage cuts all the activities into very short sequences, alternating at a very speedy reason. Therefore, it's very easy to see in the film, like in many futuristic projects of the time, a naive adhesion to the new modern idols of machine, speed, automatism, terrorism, etc., etc. Such a view of the modernist naivety, however, is soon questioned by the selection, or rather the absence of selection, of the activities that compose the communist symphony. Although the extreme fragmentation of the montage may evoke the terrorist division of tasks, so much praised in Soviet Union at that moment, it soon appears that it does exactly the contrary. It doesn't fracture a single task into a number of complementary, complementary tasks. <clears throat> complementary operations. Instead, it puts together a multiplicity of different tasks that have nothing in common except the fact that they're all manifestations of movement. So the montage captures into the same accelerated movement of interpenetration the gears of the new machines in the factories and the gesture of a woman sewing with a needle the doing of nails in a beauty parlor, or the gesture of, the, of a show shiner in the street, as well as the rotary press, the packing of cigarettes on an assembly line, or the rush of the water in a hydraulic power plant. Well, it seems difficult to consider the doing of nails in a beauty parlor, or, or the activity of a show shiner in the street as illustrations of the new communist society, or an illustration of modernity. But one must remember here what Emerson told about the barbarian times. It is from the very chaos of conflicting times and conflicting worlds that the spiritual thread of communism is extracted. Werthoff had carried this principle in a much more radical way in, in a previous film, a six, a six part of the words, six of the words, as he had shown the reality of new communist life in the Asian republics of the Soviet Union with images of camel or reindeer caravans across the steps of the tundra, calmic fishermen pulling their nets, Siberian hunters drawing their bow, nomads playing polo with goat's heads, or eating raw venison that they dip into still steaming warm blood, etc., etc. What is modern and 
communist for this reason is not the nature of the activities. It is the rhythm of the montage that creates commonality out of the very discrepancies of times that characterize the activities as it puts them together as equal quantities of movement, equal manifestations of a common energy. The fragmentation of all activities into equivalent units of movement results in a huge symphony in the flood of a continuous homogeneous present. This present is the present of the new world that the avant-garde can create through the doubling up of the not yet. It is an anticipation of communism extracted from its belatedness. Now, for this to be done, this modern or communist temporality must have a third characteristic. Not only the everyday, not only the equality of all movements, and the frag fragmentation and equality of all movement. This movement, and the, the, the characteristic is the follows, what follows, what this movement must be disconnected from the ends and means of any specific activity. It must have its end in itself. At this point, the symphony, cinematic symphony of movement meets another aspect of the modern anti-representative revolution that defines modernity in art at that moment. And this is something that I would like to examine on a short extract of the end of Man with a Movie Camera. This, ex this extract takes place at the strategic moment in the film, the moment when the montage of the activities of the day is shown in a movie theater to those who have performed those activities during the day. So the moment we can say where the anticipation, the anticipation is achieved. Well, and so, uh, so I think we can, uh, we, we can see the clip now. Perhaps we can, uh, we can, okay. So we are in the movie theater where, when the film is presented, is presented to those who have been, it, who have been its actors, but those, we are not actors during the, during the day. So. Okay, we can stop here. <coughs> well, in this sequence, so the activities of the days of the day are condensed through a limited number of movements, of movements which becomes which become symbols of the whole. Like for for instance, the 
movements of the employees in the telephone exchange. But among those movements, one is given here a highly emblematic role, and it is dance. Dance, dance plays in this passage a twofold role, a twofold role, because dance here is not presented as a kind of reminiscence, you know, of the leisures of the day. No, it is really here as a, sim a symbol, and the symbol that is presented very at the very beginning of, of, of this montage of activities. So it is. So it is here. It is here. Dance in a twofold, in a twofold role. First, it is a symbol of the collective energy. The, this collective energy epitomized in the spinning wheel of the factories and the smile of the female worker, a very famous shot. But it is also the symbol of the work of cinematographic montage that connects all the spinning movements. Now the question is, how understand this privilege given to an art, an art dance? I assume that in the conjunction of dance and cinema, what is celebrated is not only a new art, but a new paradigm of art, the paradigm of a new art of movement. And this new art of movement is the art which now has to perform the task that Emerson gave to the poet to come, the task of giving to the new times their spiritual expression and to the new community its common price. Well, if you want to understand what puts together the free movement of the ballerinas and the automatic movement of the machines, the performance of art and the performance of work, the production of electric power in Soviet power plants and the light on the screen of the movie theater. Perhaps we must ask the question to a French poet who seemingly had nothing to do with Marxist revolution, namely Stéphane Mallarmé. In 1893, Mallarmé, <coughs> attended the show given in Paris by a dancer who at, the at that time symbolized the paradigm of a new dance and more widely, the paradigm of a new art, namely Loïc Fuller. Loïc Fuller's dance broke away from the narrative tradition of the ballet since it told no story, it expressed no emotion, it took place on a stage that had been cleared of any realistic decor. Her dance was only the deployment of a spinning movement amplified by the crepe of her dress. It was the creation of a milieu through the sole expansion of movement. Malami expressed the novelty of her performance three, through three couples of notion. And interestingly, these three couples of notions for which he defined her art are three entanglements of times. Firstly, it is Louis Fuller's art is modern, he said, insofar as it is entirely classic. It is modern insofar as it achieves the indistinctness of form and content. Some people still identify with identity of form and content with an idea of the autonomy of art, but it is just the contrary. The community of form and content means the concordance of an individual artistic performance with a form of collective life, that concordance that precisely had been symbolized since Winkelmann and Hegel by Greek classical sculpture. Loïc Fuller's dance expressed a freedom which is not the manifestation of her will, but the movement through which the artistic will loses itself in the creation of an impersonal milieu. This is why Mallarmé said, and it is a second formula, which is the second entanglement of times, the art of the American dancer is Greek. It is Greek insofar as it is American. As, as a new union of form of content born out of the chaos of a new world. Now, there was a third form of entanglement of times that characterized the new dance. In Klimt, Mallarmé said, the intoxication of art with an industrial accomplishment. And Mallarmé was referring then to the spotlights, because the spotlights was, was part of Louis Fuller's performance. It was not simply technical means, but the, the spotlights were part of the performance because they expanded the radiation of her performance as they illuminated her dress and gave to the spinning movement the intensity of the fire or the colors of the rainbow. It is, I think, this union of art and industry, this union of the, of the art of the art of light and of the art of movement, 
that sustained the work of the Soviet film maker. But it does so through the mediation of the dance of an other American dancer who wished to revive the dancers of ancient Greece, namely Isadora Duncan. What makes her figure relevant to understand Vertov's association of dance, industry, and communism is her conception of free movement, the movement that is akin to the very rhythm of universal life, the rhythm of a life that has never begun and knows no ends or stops. While Mallarmé stressed the identity of the artistic artifice with the deployment of the appearing appear, 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 of things themselves, Duncan laid stress on another aspect of free movement. Free movement is a continuous movement, a movement that unrelentingly engenders another movement. This continuous movement dismisses the very opposition of movement and repose. This also means that this dismisses the Nietzschean opposition between the Apollonian art of the forms and the Dionysian expression of the unconscious forces. The form itself, the quietness of the endless undulating line, expresses the furious flow of universal life. And perhaps to understand this beyond the quarrel of Apollo and Dionysus, the frenzy of, you must think that the frenzy of free movement reaches back to the Schillerian definition of the aesthetic state as a state of equilibrium between activity that, and passivity that dismisses the normal and hierarchical coordinates of sensible experience. Or, of course, and also, of course, it reminds us of Schiller's definition of, of, play, of play as precisely this activity which has its end in itself and that must create not only a new, uh, a new idea of art, but perhaps a, a new art of life. And of course, we, we can, go, we can, bed, we can uh, <clears throat> get back still further behind Schiller's aesthetic state and behind Schiller's idea of his identity of movement and repose. There is a description made by Winkelmann of the torso of the Belvedere, the torso of an inactive Hercules, on which the thought of the hero enjoying the glory of his past deeds was expressed by the sole undulations of the muscles, getting into one another in the same way as the waves of the sea, which unrelentingly rise and fall back. In order to understand what this equivalence of movement and repose means, we must go still further back, the immobile movement of the wave, or the equality of activity and passivity in the aesthetic free play, must be thought in relation to a famous distinction made by Aristotle in the eight books of his politics. Aristotle opposed two forms of inactivity, which also define two forms of temporality. There is rest, which is the pose, the relaxation needed by the bodies dedicated to work before a new tension and a new effort. And there is leisure, the free time of those who are not submitted to the constraint of labor. We know that this hierarchy of inaction went along with a hierarchy of action. Those who could enjoy leisure were the active men or the free men, those who were not subjected to the constraint of daily work. They were called active because they could either project before themselves the ends of their action or act for the sole pleasure of acting. So act precisely in taking action as an end in itself. The passive men were called so because their activities only were the immediate means of immediate ends. This is why they were also called mechanical men, men entrapped in the universe of means, which is the universe of necessity. So what the free movement of the wave epitomizes, I think, is the dismissal of the hierarchy of time and, of time and movement that divided the humankind into classes, the free men and the mechanical men. It is this dismissal of the hierarchical distribution of times that underpins the art of life and movement, we can say the art of American light and Greek movement, which links artistic intoxication with industrial accomplishment. It does so because it epitomizes the whole redistribution of the sensible. It is 
this redistribution of the hierarchy of times that makes the reconciliation of modernity with itself possible. And it is the task that the art of the avant-garde must achieve in the construction of a new egalitarian sensorium in which all the activities are equal and are part of the same global movement. The problem is that this equality has one condition. Free movement is a movement that is not subordinated to any end, but its own accomplishment. Free, mo free, mo free movement is an activity that has its end in itself, or in a way that has no end, that is endless, both in the, in the sense that it has, that it has uh, no, <coughs> it has no, no point, no, no point where it ceases, but also. Uh, uh, but, also to the extent that it has no specific, it has no specific go goal ex except its own reproduction. To that extent, free move, to that extent, free movement, the movement of Isadora Duncan's dance, but also the movements of the hands and the machine the, during all the activities of the day in vert of montage. In that, in that sense, free movement is <coughs> achieves a certain idea of communism, the idea that was expressed in those texts of the young Marx that I evoked earlier. Communism is a state in which work, which is the expression of the generic activity of the human being, is no more subordinated for the workers to the mere necessity of earning their livings, in which it is only the deployment of their free activity. In short, Communism is a form of life in which mechanical men have become free men because the means and ends of action have become one and the same reality. And it is that sort of communism that the movements of the ballerinas, the spinning wheel in the factory, the gestures of the worker on the assembly line or of the employees on the telephone exchange enjoy as they are connected within the same common movement. But they are so unconditioned that each of those actions be disconnected from its own temporality, disconnected from the ends that it pursues, and that they all share the same characteristic, unwillingness. Of course, this condition came, came up against the strategic requirements of the edification of communism by the Communist Party. For the latter, the communist identity of ends and means was an end to be reached in the future by first establishing its condition of, of possibility. The machines in the factory, the gestures of the workers and the performances in the theaters were not equivalent demonstrations of free movement. They were tools that must build each in their own manner the conditions of possibility of that future. One readily sees in this conflict, you know, the immemorial conflict between artistic freedom and political constraint. I think it's more fruitful to think of it as a conflict of temporalities. From the point of view of the state, of the state avant-garde, communism cannot be anticipated. It cannot exist before its material foundations have been laid. From the point of view of the aesthetic avant-garde, communism cannot exist if it has not anticipated itself in the construction of a common sensorium. This might be summed up as the conflict between the Franco-German political paradigm and the Americano-Greek aesthetic paradigm of modernity. The conflict opposing two conceptions of the conflict of times which characterizes modernity. Well, we know how the quarrel was settled. The constructors of real communism urged artists to give up the pretension of weaving in advance the sensible forms of a new community the pretension of reconciling modernity with itself. There could, be only, there could be only for them one temporality, the temporality of ends and means, which was also the temporality of work and rest. So what Soviet artists had to do was to serve the strategy of the party by representing the efforts and the problems of the real people and by recreating, the, recreating them after the pains of their labor which means that they had to go back to the old logic of the representative regime of art. Now, this repression of the historical modernist project paved the way for the retrospective invention of a new modernism in the times of Clement Greenberg. 
He too set out to erase the entanglement of times by redrawing the unique and one-way temporality of the capitalist society, producing both the separation of the avant-garde from the common beliefs and symbols and the unleashing of kitsch culture. This also meant redrawing the inner division of temporalities by clearly separating the time of the free men able to follow the one-way movement of avant-garde from the mechanical men consumers of kitsch culture. It may be useful, I think, beyond the quarrels about modernism and postmodernism, to reinvestigate those entanglements of times which perhaps were the true core of the modernist project or of a modernist, modernist dream of construction of a new world. I spoke of an archaeology or the dream of an archaeology. Well, now an archaeological project, as, an, as I think of it, is not simply a project that, that wants to cast a new light on the past. <clears throat> in, in, and, in, and anyhow, the past, the, our relation of, of, to our past, of course, is part of our, our present. But it's more, it, it, it is more than this. this uh, an archaeological project is also a project of reinvestigating the complex structure of what we call a time. A time is always a plurality of intertwined forms of temporality. And this intertwinement is also a moving relationship between two fundamental dimensions of time, time as a line stretched between the past and the future, and time as the inner split which separates forms of life by separating forms of temporality. And this is what was at stake, after, after all, in this reconstruction of a common time. We staging this complexity, I think, may also be a way of distancing ourselves from the dominant logic which has transformed the Marxist historical necessity into the necessity of the one-way process, leading to the triumph of the free market. It may, be also, it may also be a way of distancing ourselves from the melancholic discourse, which describes our, pre our time as the time of the hegemony of the present, the illusion of the absolute present of universal communication and absolute alienation. It may be a way of reopening a time of the possible. Thank you for your attention.